Uh, can I just ask one clarification? Uh, the, the previous witness talked about the review process and how extensive it was. I, is it accurate to say, though, that in the end, the 15 members of the NHPRC um, uh, board make the final decision? Is that an accurate statement? So in the end, I mean, whatever process is in place, these 15 people decide who gets taxpayer dollars and who doesn't. Is that right? I would think that the board votes on, on, on the archivist has the final say. I'm, I'm told by staff the archivist has the final say. Right. But at the, in the end, it's those 15 people. I'm, I'm sure it, it recommended to the archivist. Thank you. By the board. Thank you. Uh, I now would like to introduce our second panel. Our first witness will be Mr. Michael Beschlitz. And a, an historian specializing in the U.S. presidency and American politics. Mr. Beschlis is a regular commentator on the PBS NewsHour and is the NBC News presidential historian. He is the vice president of the Foundation for the National Archive. Our next witness is Dr. Stephen Hahn of the University of Pennsylvania. He is the co-editor of Freedom, a documentary history of emancipation which benefited from NHPRC funding. He is the author of A Nation Under Our Feet, a black political struggle in the rural South from slavery to the Great Migration, which received a Pulitzer Prize in history for 2004. And after Dr. Hahn, we will hear from Ms. Karen Jefferson, head of archives and special collections at Atlanta University Center. She was a founding member of the, of the archives and archivists of Color Roundtable. In 2003, she received the University of Maryland's James Partridge Outstanding African American Information Professional Award. And our next witness will be Dr. Ira Berlin of the University of Maryland, here today representing the American Historical Association. He is the founding editor of the Freedmen and Southern Society Project, supported by the NHPRC. His first books, Slaves Without Masters, The Free Negro in the Antebellum South, won the best first book prize awarded by the National Historical Society. And our last witness on this panel will be Dr. Pete Daniel, retired curator at the National Museum of American History, and here today representing the Organization of American Historians, of which he is a past president. He is author of Lost Revolutions, The South in the 1950s, which won the Elliot Run Rudwick Prize. And I thank all of our witnesses uh, for appearing today and look forward to their testimony. It is the policy of the subcommittee to swear in our witnesses. Before they testify, would you all please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. You may be seated. Be seated. Let the record reflect that the witnesses answered in the affirmative, and I ask that each of the witnesses now give a brief summary of their testimony, and please limit your summary to five minutes, and your complete written statement will be included in the hearing today. Uh, Mr. Beschlis, uh, please begin with your opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'll try to do better than five. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me and my colleagues here this afternoon both as an historian and also as vice president of the Foundation for the National Archives, I'm very glad you're holding this hearing. Uh, as one who appreciates history, Mr. Chairman, you know that our founders devoutly hoped to make this country different from England and the other monarchies of Europe. One way they wanted us to be different was the way we Americans treat our history. As you know, the kings and queens of Europe were in favor of history, but only official history. Uh, documents and other evidence that showed their mistakes were suppressed or destroyed. And when the founders began to work on what the United States should be, they knew all of that. And unlike the U Europeans, they felt that for a country's political system, history should be treated not as a dangerous threat to be harnessed, but as a mighty force that could make the country better. Our early leaders felt that only if we knew our full history could we really know how and why our past leaders and citizens succeeded and also how and why they failed. And I think you can say that from the beginning, those founders practiced what they preached. If you go back to the closed door debates of the Constitutional Convention, 1787, you'll find the most detailed accounts of what they said and did. There are letters, there are transcripts, there are diaries, there are notes. 
over two centuries later we can hear those actual voices and they speak to us. We're using those records even still to argue about those constitutional debates and how our society in 2010 compares to the early expectations. I think it's not too much to say that if the founders came back today, they would love the fact that we Americans have created an NHPRC. I think they would feel there's no more patriotic act than creating historical records, preserving them, and then making them available as quickly as possible to the widest number of Americans. And I think they would also love the fact that the NHPRC is not just concerned with the great and famous. It's shown itself just as eager to preserve and publish the letters of Swedish immigrants, for instance, in my home state of Illinois, as the letters of President John Adams and his cabinet. I think the NHPRC's work is now more important than it ever has been. Unlike earlier generation of, generations of Americans, we in 2010 don't tend to write many letters or diaries, and not too many of us pour our innermost thoughts and emotions into an email. So I think it couldn't be more vital for the NHPRC to do everything it can to encourage the creation of some kind of detailed historical record. Let me offer a quick example from my own professional experience. I've been working since 1994 on several books in which I transcribe, edit, and try to explain the tapes that President Lyndon Johnson made of 10,000 of his private conversations on the telephone in the Oval Office and elsewhere while he was president. Until the Johnson tapes began to be opened in 1994, almost no, no one knew that LBJ had secretly taped people he talked to without their knowledge, including his wife, by the way, which I would not recommend for any marriage, but she took it with some good humor. Uh, in retrospect, it's probable that, uh, probably terrible that Johnson di didn't tell his friends that he was taping them, but it's an inexhaustible treasure for the American people. Uh, some of President Johnson's language on those tapes, I'm afraid, is not fit for me to repeat in this hearing. But one lesson which is on them, which I'll close with, is something I don't think the chairman or any member of this subcommittee will disagree with, and that is this. Presidents should listen to members of Congress. Not a bad thought. Uh, May 1964, LBJ was talking to his old mentor, Senator Richard Russell of Georgia, about whether to go to war in Vietnam. Russell was Mr. Defense, but thought Vietnam was a loser. And on these tapes, he tells Johnson, Vietnam is a tragic situation. It's just one of those places where you can't win. It'll be the most expensive venture this country ever went into. He was absolutely right. How different the history of our country could have been had LBJ not rejected Russell's wise advice. I think that one conversation between a single president and a single powerful senator is just one of the cautionary les lessons that are crucial, I think, for later American presidents and also for all of us citizens. And I think if it weren't for the kind of work so well championed by the NHRPC, we wouldn't even know that that conversation took place. Thank you, Mr. Bachelot, for that brief uh, history lesson. Uh, and I, I'm so glad you sanitized uh, President Johnson's life. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Hahn, you're, you're up. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Chairman Clay, uh, Ranking Member Chaffetz, uh, Congressman Jordan. Um, my name is Stephen Hahn, and uh, I'm a professor of history at the University of Pennsylvania, and I'm very pleased to have the opportunity of coming before this committee today to speak in support of the authorization of and increased funding for the NHPRC. Uh, I have been, as Chairman Clay suggested, a direct beneficiary of the resources that the NHPRC has made available, and I've seen the many ways in which projects that the Commission has supported benefit historical learning and understanding in the United States. Early in my career, I worked as an associate editor at the Freedom History Project at the University of Maryland, a project that has been gained, uh, had been supported by the NHPRC. At the time, I was a newly minted PhD and very excited about the work that the Freedom History Project was doing, assembling a multi-volume documentary history of slave emancipation in the United States using the records deposited at the National Archives. Most editorial projects then and since have focused on very well-known, nationally significant, and powerful figures and institutions. 
The Freedom History Project, by contrast, was uncovering the experiences of both the powerful and powerless, of policymakers and bureaucrats, of ordinary soldiers and slaves who were bringing about the destruction of slavery and the construction of a free society in the largest emancipation the world had ever seen, and I might add, also the best documented one. Owing to the documents that I had the opportunity to read, compile, and annotate during my year as an associate editor on the project, I became increasingly interested in African American politics in the rural South. The material that I was using raised intriguing questions, both about what former slaves were doing in their first years uh, of freedom and about where their sensibilities and practices came from. When I left the project to take up a post in the history department at the University of California, San Diego, I decided to pursue some of the questions and to write a book about what I found. That book, A Nation Under Our Feet, Black Political Struggles in the Rural South, From Slavery to the Great Migration, was, uh, um, which I began to formulate while I was working at the Freedom History Project, was eventually published by Harvard University Press and was awarded the 2004 Pulitzer Prize in History. Now, over the years that the NHPRC has supported the Freedom History Project, numerous historians like myself have had the opportunity to find work in this rich intellectual environment, to develop our skills as researchers and writers, and subsequently, in no small measure, uh, owing to our experience at the Freedom History Project, have been hired into full-time positions at a range of colleges and universities, and have produced scholarship of genuine importance. Former editors now hold professorships at 15 different institutions of higher education across the United States. They have won major prizes for their work. They have become MacArthur Foundation Fellows. They have served on state humanities councils. And they've been elected, as um, Professors uh, Berlin and, and uh, Daniel have, President of the Organization of American Historians. But the impact of the NHPRC goes well beyond academic employment and published scholarship. It nourishes the educations and intellectual appetites of students and other learners at all levels of American society. In the time since I worked at the Freedom History Project, I have used the project documents and essays in my lecture courses and seminars at the University of Pennsylvania and elsewhere. I have also brought them into the many public school teacher workshops I have participated in in, the, in those years. The teachers, in turn, have brought the documents and other related materials into their junior and senior high school classrooms and have stimulated interest in our past and an exciting sense of discovery among their students. And I use the project materials extensively when I taught college-level courses for economically disadvantaged adults in North Chicago in what is known as the Odyssey program earlier in the past decade. The reach of the NHPRC has been enormous, and the benefits that have derived from its resources are greater still. At a time when the connections between past and present are very much a part of public consciousness and the political discourse, we need to promote the type of work that can make the past and our many pasts come alive for all Americans. The NHPRC has already made an invaluable contribution toward that end, and I would urge you to authorize the level of funding that will allow the Commission not only to continue, but also to expand its important undertakings. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I would be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you for your testimony, Dr. Hahn, and thank you for your important work in, Amer in preserving American history. Ms. Jefferson, you recognize for five minutes. Congressman Clay and members of the subcommittee, thank you for allowing me to testify to you today about the NHPRC. Um, I'm representing uh, my library who has benefited from the uh, support of NHPRC through our uh, state uh, humanities uh, board, and I'm going to talk about how we benefited in that way. Um, 
First of all, I want to say that the archival profession uh, greatly is appreciative of the work of the NHPRC, and that extends to our state uh, records historical advisory boards that is, uh, impacts us the most. And I'm going to talk about uh, Georgia's historical records advisory board and um, the work that it does and how it benefits us directly. Um, first of all, we have a wonderful directory that the uh, uh, GRAB is what we call our historical uh, board. And this directory is an online directory of over 600 different organizations in the state of Georgia so that we know who we are, who is collecting the history, who is preserving the history, and also so that the citizens, our educators, our students, and our researchers will know how to find out where the, re where the records are in Georgia. Um, the grants program, of course, are the regrants re program that is done by um, GRAB through funding from NHPRC has been very helpful. Um, our institution has received a small grant, as has our sister institution, Spelman College Archives to help us do our work. A lot of those awards are very small. They're $2,000 to maybe $15,000, but they're vital to the work that we do. They are covering programs that deal with startup funds to help you begin your archives, to help you improve um, the work that your archives is doing. Um, in particular, it funds educational opportunities. And as archivists, we have to stay abreast of what are the best practices and the standards so that we can preserve the records. And these educational opportunities through our state uh, uh, historical advisory boards are brought to the state and made more accessible. And they are less expensive because we don't have to travel and spend extra money uh, to go outside to learn about uh, changes and developments that we should use in our work. Um, this is particular that you've done. Uh, we, we believe that, I believe at least personally, that the work needs to continue. But I'll start with Mr. Beschloss here. If we're going to follow what President Obama's chief of staff and management director, of, of, uh, budget director, have asked for, and we're going to have to make a cut, what are we going to cut? I mean, looking at the archives, you're the uh, vice president of the board of directors foundation for the National Archives. What would you cut? Uh, that's slightly above my pay grade. That's what <laughs> you are all here to do. Uh, I guess it's rare in Washington when someone says they don't know, but you know, fair enough. Fair that, enough. That's I, not I my, appreciate the candor. That's I, not I my perspective. Okay, all, right, I, all I can I'll give you a say list, is, by the way, oh, oh, pardon? I can give you a list. <laughs> okay. All I can say is that you know, let's say you decided to you know stop this for five years. There's a lot of the things that we've all been talking about this afternoon that would disappear forever. You can't and get and them let me, back. Let me tell you, I have not heard any person ever suggest that we would totally stop funding sure. the entire no, I'm, archive I'm just program. using as a point of comparison. I know. I, I, and I, just as clarification, yeah. my point is we have hundreds of millions of dollars that will still be allocated to this. And I, su nice. I support that. But we're trying to trim the budget. We're trying to make some tough decisions. Uh, uh, Dr. Hahn, you, you are very accomplished. You are very well published. I mean, just read, try to read through your CV, which we just got, would you know, take, take a long period of time. And, and, and your career has been very accomplished. I, I need to ask you, though. It says on the truth and testimony disclosure, please list any federal grants or contracts, including subgrants and subcontracts that, that you have received since October 1, 2006. Are you saying you haven't received any? None. No. Nothing. Nope. And my understanding is that the University of Pennsylvania has received some... $518,000 worth of grants through the NHPRC. Well, it didn't come to me. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Dr. Berlin, let me ask you the same question. Please list any federal grants or contracts, including sub-grants sub or subcontracts that you received since October 1, 2006. Not a nickel. My understanding is the total funding for the American Historical Association is $536,863 and that uh, you've been you're here representing the American Historical Association. Why the discrepancy? You haven't given me a nickel. It's outrageous. Would you please turn on I'm your sorry. microphone? There you go. Uh, I have received no money uh, from the uh, federal government uh, uh, for a grant or uh, as a member of the American Historical Association, I have not participated in a project uh, that I know which has been funded by the federal government. 
the American Historical Association and the University of Maryland are uh, particularly the latter, are particularly big entities. They get a lot of money uh, from the federal government. They do all kinds of contract work. Uh, we have the largest physics department in the world. Uh, un unfortunately, very little of it uh, has uh, has come to me, and nothing has come to me since 2006. And you're supposed to also list if the American Historical Association has, has received anything. You're saying that the American Historical Association has received no money. I have received no money. Well, mm. I, your form is, I, I beg you to go back and look at your form, because okay. what you signed uh, two days ago says that the American Historical Association has received no money. We think you've received over $500,000 mm. through that association. And I would also ask Dr. Hahn if you would go back and review that form, please. But, but Dr. Uh, Mr. Chaffetz, I don't, I'm not sure he's speaking for It says he is. Number four, other than yourself, are you testifying on behalf of any non-governmental entity? Yes, the American Historical Association. I invited him as a professor. I'm the yes. Of Maryland. It also says on the document that you provide, Mr. Chairman, representing the American Historical Association. I am representing the American Historical Association. The American here Historical today. Association received over five hundred thousand dollars, and you don't know that. And I, I do not. I do not know that, and I couldn't tell That's you what they've stunning. received. It, what they've received it for. Nor do I think I'm responsible. Nor do I think that I'm responsible for the grants that the American right. Historical Association. I was asked to come here to speak on the American Historical Association's position on the National Historical Records. Commission. I have done that. I've done that to the best of my ability. I've done that with great honesty. I am not an employee of the American Historical Association. I am a member of that association with, with some 20,000 other uh, people who are interested in, interested in history. So I don't think that's my, I don't think that's my responsibility. What, I, what I'm asking for is to go back and look at that document, because I think you will find that you are supposed to, as a representative of the American Historical Association, present to us in the Congress, so we have time to review it, and we did not get it in advance, so that we understand. That's why the Congress created the truth and testimony, and I feel that it's incomplete. This gentleman's, gentleman's, gentleman's time has expired. Yeah. Gentleman from Ohio. Quick question. Did, did the gentleman, did Mr. Berlin, did you, did you uh, consult with the American uh, historical oh, Association sorry. prior to Wait filling out the, uh, the form? Jordan, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let me, let me recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Driehaus. Five minutes. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I want to thank the panel for being here. Uh, it is certainly not my intent to impugn your integrity. Um, I think you're all here representing interests and, and you do have a body of work and, and dedication to uh, historical archives and record keeping uh, that are tremendous. Uh, I'd like to follow up on the chairman's inquiry as to the value and, and the value of this relatively small investment into uh, cultural preservation and historical preservation. And if we could just go down the road. Uh, I mentioned earlier I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio. We have the Underground Railroad Freedom Center. Um, which has been uh, tremendous not just for educating people as to the uh, everyday issues of freedom that we experience globally today, but also the history of the Underground Railroad Freedom Center, or the Underground Railroad, and, and the extent that slavery impacted um, the South and the North, and the impact uh, the Ohio River played, and so many places along the river played. But it's also been uh, tremendously beneficial to us uh, culturally economically, and from an educational perspective, uh, the students from all over the region are now better informed when it comes to issues of freedom because of that institution. I think those investments are good investments. Um, so uh, I would like to talk, I would like you to talk about any examples you might have of um, investments made that you're familiar with and, and the benefits, the compound benefits. Uh, that you might see in those investments? Well, I'd, I'd say it. In a general way, Mr. Driehaus, I think a, a, an American is a better citizen if he or she knows history, and we're in a time when more and more Americans know less and less about history. So I would say for a relatively modest investment, this would mean that the federal government is saying not only do we feel that 
uh, it's important for Americans to know history and also use primary sources, but also that history and primary documents are not just those that are sitting in Washington. Just as important, and sometimes more so, are collections and other historical evidence that uh, can be very far from here. Just, just to follow up, um, having served on as a board member of a local historical society, and uh, working very closely as a state legislator with the Ohio Historical Society. Uh, I'm very familiar with the difficulty these small organizations have in preserving local history, and, and I think you're absolutely right. While we have a tremendous resource in the archives and the Library of Congress to protect so many of our national documents, when it comes to communities and when it comes to state history and, and the impact that history has made, Preserving those documents is extremely difficult and, and becoming more and more difficult as resources are cut. W would you not agree? I would, and I'd say something else, too. I'm all for costs being borne as much by the private sector as possible. And this is something that does that, because if you reauthorize in a strong way the NHPRC, you're making the statement to local communities, we think that this is important as a country. That will bring, and I'm sure you saw this in your own experience, people who are local to say, well, maybe this is something I should contribute to myself. Yes, thank you. Um, well, let me very, your question is very large in many respects, but let me just say a couple of things briefly. Um, for one thing is that, uh, and I, I speak to the question of um, jobs that the uh, projects at the NHPRC funds uh, make possible. You know, we're at a very, very difficult time in this country, not simply um, because the general problems that the economic crisis has posed, but certainly for those people who are interested in their past and in the intellectual life of their country and the possibility of going on and becoming um, academics and um, writers and teachers, uh, that we're, we're in jeopardy of potentially losing an entire generation because there's no work for them. Um, the NHPRC, uh, most of the money goes to pay uh, salaries and um, has been enormously important, even in the time that I've seen it, even when times were better economically, in making it possible for historians to sort of find their footing. The other thing I'd just like to say is that uh, one of the things I have seen, too, with the use of documents and the kind of documentary collections that the NHPRC makes possible is what it means for students to read about and understand how the most ordinary of people at different times in our past have been able to act in ways that really make a difference in their lives and in the lives of their communities. It's not something that you can simply get up and tell them about. It's something that they can see by using the materials. And I think there's no way to measure the kind of consequences and excitement and possibilities that that experience opens up. Again, I just want to speak to how important it is for the practitioners, for the archivists and the records managers, and how the support um, comes through the state so that we can get the training to do the work that we need to do, that we can get funding for some of the small projects, that we can get startup money so that we do have uh, archivists and professional people to care for some of the local records. There are a lot of uh, uh, areas that do not have professionals uh, to take care of the materials. And that's where we get the funding for these small kinds of projects on a local level. And we get the training so that we know how to deal with electronic records, so we know how to respond in a disaster recovery. Uh, these kinds of projects uh, really are important and vital to our community as, as we uh, you know, work uh, to preserve our records. So the, I can't stress it enough. The gentleman's time has expired. Thank you. You're welcome. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized. I want to thank the chairman. Uh, let me say, too, I appreciate all the work uh, that you do and the fact that you are uh, keeping part of history, not only for us, but for our, our families and, and generations to come. Dr. Hunt, I did want to ask you, you made a comment uh, a while ago that you had received no federal funding. And uh, as my colleague, Mr. Chavis, had said, uh, I looked at your accomplishments, and uh, there are quite a lot. How did you do that? How did you accomplish all the things that you've had? Where did you get the resources, and where did that money come from? 
Well, um, I teach uh, at university and I've taught at a number of universities. Uh, I have applied for and I have um, received um, grants from non-governmental agencies to uh, advance my research and um, spending my own money in whatever way I could uh, to make my trips to archives that um, uh, have organized records and made them available to me uh, so that well, I could do that. So, so there are other grants out there other than the, the grants coming from the federal government? Well, there are all sorts of grants. I mean, I apply to um, granting agencies for individual scholarly grants, mm -hmm. exactly. What would you say the total sum of all the work that you have done? If could you put a price tag on it? I, mean, I know that that would be awful. Well, it's hard priceless. For you. Yeah, I, I understand. I'll second that. I, 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 I understand. I understand. And, and, I, and I'm sure it is. But I mean, is there any? I, I, I so it is priceless. I mean, you couldn't even put a value on it, really. I, I think the time and energy that uh, most uh, people like myself and academics in general, I mean, we uh, are on our own bill for the most part, and um, it's a tremendous but you burden. Got it. What? But, to, but yes, but you, you know, as, uh, as the American way is, you got it done without the federal government, right? Um, certainly since 2006. Sir? I, I, yes, this is since 2006. Uh, since 2006? True. Right. And, and Dr. Berlin, uh, you said the same thing, that you had not received any... Uh, not since that, 2006. Not since 2006. Right. So you but, had, let me, but let me so say... So you had prior. So both of you had received money prior to 2006. Let, uh, you're, go ahead. I, I am deeply indebted to the federal government. Uh, for uh, for my own position and for the scholarship I scholarship I created, uh, probably the largest debt, in point of fact, is to the NHPRC. I'm pleased to I'm pleased to acknowledge it. I came to the NHPIC with an idea, an idea that we could write a documentary history of emancipation, that we could tell the story of how this country goes from being a free country, being a slave country. I, yes, sir. Not, they, they, they supported that. They supported that. And they continue to support that, even though I'm not involved. I'm not yes, involved sir. in that. I understand. Uh, but, so well, that my own career, in some ways, rests upon, you know, those federal grants. Yeah. But you have done things without federal grants. I have I'm done saying. things without federal okay. grants. So, so things can be done without getting grants from the federal government that would preserve history? Certainly many things can be done and many things have been done. What I would, what I would, would stress to you is that this project, I am confident, I could not yeah. be done. I understand. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, let me, let me just uh, ask uh, one other question, and, and I apologize for not being here earlier, and this may have already been answered, but there are you know, if you look at the National Historical Publications and Records Commission, the National Archives and Records Administration, National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Institute of Museum and Library Services, do you see any duplication there of anything that's being done? Because I've read of some of the grants that have come out of, uh, of the, the history. And it looks like some of that could be money that should come out of the arts or the museum or, or the libraries. Do you see any duplication whatsoever in these agencies? And when you apply for a grant, do you apply to all f or would someone applying for a grant, uh, and any of you jump in on this, would you, would you apply to all of them or just one in particular? Would you like me to? Yeah, you're fine. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I, I, let me talk to what I know, uh, and I know about two of those agencies that you've mentioned, the NHPRC uh, and the NEH, the National Endowment for the Humanities, because I sat on the National Council for the National Endowment for the Humanities under President Clinton and under President Bush. Yes, so I know something about those, uh, something about those two agencies. I would say if we took the two and we look for coincidences, we look for po you know, places of overlap, we would find very, very small areas of, of, areas of, of overlap. 
uh, there would be some areas in which there would be absolutely no overlap, that is the grants to archival, archival agencies. There might be some areas uh, in which there was some overlap in, in various, publication, various publication projects. But I would say that they were very, 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 very small. And okay, but let me ask you a yeah, question. Okay, but, sure. but if you were applying for a grant, would you apply to all four of these, or one in particular? I, I, I certainly, there were several of those agencies which I wouldn't apply to at all, for certain, you know, so I wouldn't apply. So if I was looking for a grant to write my history of emancipation, I wouldn't apply to the museum, right? Uh, there, would be no, there would be no expired. point in that. Gentleman's time expired. Okay. A gentleman from Ohio. Mr. Chairman, let me just uh, – first, I just want to follow up, Mr. Uh, Dr. Berlin, if I could, on where uh, Ranking Member Chaffetz was. Did you consult with the American Historical Association um, and ask them about any uh, grant dollars they had received prior to filling out your form and signing it that you had received no money? No. So Sounds like I should have, but I did not. So you, you, this – would you then say that, that what that you submitted to the, this Committee of the United States Congress is inaccurate? Where you said on question eight that you received no money or, or organizations you were representing, even though you said on number four you were representing the American Historical Association, would you the say that the, the way statement I, you submitted to Congress and signed is inaccurate? No. You think it's the accurate? Way, the way I interpreted it, yes, it's absolutely accurate. Okay. Appreciate it. No further questions. Or I'll yield, yield my time to the ranking member. Okay, thanks. I recognize the gentlewoman from the District of Columbia, Ms. Norton. Well, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate uh, that you held this hearing and only regret that other congressional business kept me from uh, attending. Uh, I am struck uh, uh, by the fact that the Commission may have set a new record uh, 20 years <laughs> at the same funding. Congratulations. <laughs>